Thank you very much indeed for the invitation. And as you will see, uh, I gave a very eclectic title to my presentation, Europe, Sustainability, Population Dynamics, Water and More. More will be less, but I will uh, touch upon all these issues. There are two reasons. One is the title, 30 years after, it is a change of, uh, in Europe and uh, integration of uh, the former communist com uh, countries into the European Union and the state of Europe also in the light of the question of sustainability. Population mm -hmm. dynamics, I prefer this term instead of migration because it is not only migration and in order to have migration you have to really heat up the situation and population dynamics covers also population growth. And water is my original metier, so I want a little bit to reflect how we deal with water, why is water so important, and uh, what everybody has to know about water. Uh, is Europe sustainable? And some of the PowerPoints I'm showing now, I used already on 29th of May when I was here at uh, IASC and, and uh, gave a talk fresh after the European elections. And when you look back and see the website of the European Union itself in 2018, they figured out that from the then uh, 28 countries... Can you switch uh, the slides? Yeah, okay. Directly, you know? okay. Uh, 22 gave the top issue of concern is migration and 6 gave terrorism. And only economic situation, uh, European Union countries, public finance state and unemployment came after in the list of what is the most important concern of the countries and the people. So you can simply see that security issues prevail over livelihood issues. So it is a, a mental set of Europe is we are under threat. The second is you see no vision for the future as a concept. How we want to move, what we want. It's a kind of, of icy uh, stop and, and a kind of, uh, of uh, no movement. Uh, and actually what is most important that global concern, climate change, poverty, hunger, what is happening elsewhere in the world, appear only, if at all, implicitly. And the real threats in Europe Aging and Industry 4.0 is completely missing. The European Union, no politician in this bloody continent is able or willing to talk about what does it imply. It implies in Germany four to five million jobs lost. Of course, some new will be created, but those lost are not, won't be able to take up those jobs created. And no one is willing to talk about it. So, uh, then we had the European election, now it is one month old, and uh, what, what I read in the uh, uh, results that there is a more even distribution ac uh, across the political spectrum. The central part is lost, and the two uh, extreme uh, uh, ends of the distribution function uh, got some strengths, not as dramatic as they hoped for, fortunately, but still there is a more even distribution and it was actually a warning shot of the electorate, but unfortunately it is not understood as such. If you listen uh, to uh, the political discourse ever since, you realize that there are three parties, the liberal, liberal blocs, the Social Democrats and the European People's Party, the Christian Democratic parties, or the more uh, uh, bourgeois parties, they still consider that they run the show. There is no uh, extreme left, and they ignore that there are three uh, right-wing uh, or, or populist uh, fractions, altogether 171 deputies, it is 20% of the European Parliament. And uh, they talk as these people would not be there. I'm not saying that you have to go and immediately bring them into mainstream politics, 
but you have to realize that 20 percent of the population voted for parties for whatever reason, mainly not because of their appealing politics, but because they were dissatisfied with the business as usual, the nice term, bow, business as usual. So uh, the liberals and greens uh, gained some especially because the French uh, governing party declared itself liberal. This is a good question whether they are, but anyhow, so they might become the kingmakers. And as you remember, two, a few days ago, apparently uh, Macron, the French president, and they say the Visegrad states commonly say it will be Ursula von der Leyen which is a good choice, I would say. The lady has seven children and a wonderful career, so uh, she would be able to manage Europe if she's able to manage a husband and seven children. Okay, the two major parties are the main losers, but they still behave as they would be winners. And this is a very, very dangerous situation. You do not realize the situation you are in. Neither the political parties and, of course, not what Europe is in. Uh, so. Uh, my conclusion in 29th of May was that I'm afraid that the outcome is failed to let deliver answers, but let's see what they, whether they understood the wake-up call. A month later, political horse trading is still on business as usual, nothing changed, and this is bad news for Europe and bad news for us. Uh, let me very short on this. There are, uh, while I'm talking, please read it. Uh, there are a lot of interesting issues which are not even addressed uh, by change. And, and also, uh, I was very critical of the Hungarian uh, electoral process uh, to the European election because it was saying no migration, no migration, no migration. It is, uh, may get some votes, uh, the ruling party won, but by not 55% as was predicted, but only by 52%. Uh, by the uh, scores of Orban, it is actually a loss. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, I was missing a positive message. A positive message could be what the Hungarian politics is, we are for the Europe of nations. But this was missing. This was not said that we want strong nations working together. This would have been uh, exactly the Hungarian political status, but packaged in a positive way. Not even a positive packaging is, is, is given us. And, and this is, could backfire because the people with a negative uh, uh, views, uh, negative headlines, uh, you can generate fear, but you can, uh, cannot generate enthusiasm. Okay. Uh, how serious is the use? Because you could say the politicians won't change. Uh, Mr. Bogardi won't change. He is already old, and uh, none of us would really change. But the use may change. And I'm a little bit uh, concerned because they selected Fridays for demonstrations, so they are not going to school instead of using their free Saturdays to demonstrate. I would be much more impressed if Saturdays would be uh, selected to demonstrate and not Fridays, because this is a kind of, of, of childish uh, uh, having fun not going to school and making good and getting the media. And the media is stupid enough to praise this effort. So this is a huge responsibility of the media, and we are in a kind of transition uh, through the digital economy, but also the digital societies, we are getting into Twitter politics, uh, whether it is Trump or the others. Nobody, you do not need newspapers, everything is almost online, and we are unable to deal with it, at least myself, uh, uh, time-wise, mentality-wise, and, and it is not, not no, no rules and regulations. You see how many times Facebook has to be blasted and they still don't behave. Now, let's go a little bit further and, and talk about migration, climate change, and sustainability per se. This is the last 100,000 years, uh, made mainly on ice core data evaluation. And you see that the last 100,000 years of Earth's history was a uh, uh, rodeo ride. Temperatures went up, went down, went up, went down, and only the last uh, period after the last ice age, so suddenly an anomaly uh, happened. This anomaly, which lasts still probably, 
is about 10,000 years maximum. This enabled agriculture, this enabled human societies to flourish, this enabled population to grow, and it is a basis of human civilization. Humans survived this period, but there were huge outmigrations of Africa reaching Australia, coming to Asia and Europe. This is human history in a nutshell. It's only 100,000 years. It's, uh, humans are probably, or uh, hominids are around since a million years. But when we talk about sustainability in the modern sense, uh, we uh, should not look back more than 10,000 years or 7,000 years or 5,000 years. And if you look into the history, you see there were huge changes, uh, climate changes, even so they are not recorded here in this scale and uh, changed uh, again a lot in, in the world history. Now, if this situation coming to the end, whether it is man-made or not, it harangues a very difficult uh, situation. We have to master and we have to borne in mind that this was a gift of nature or it was a cos cosmical gift for humanity and we have to use this situation to prepare for much worse, whether man-made or nature. <clears throat> and we do exactly the opposite. The 20th century made a lot of changes. So this acceleration, especially since the Second World War, which is said the great acceleration of human enterprise, everything goes up exponentially, including population, and also a threefold population increase in the last century uh, uh, corresponded with six-fold increase of water use. So we are over-proportionally, as development is, is taking its course, over-proportionally uh, using the world resources. Area of cropland almost doubled, pasture decreased, and of course uh, uh, no nomadic exchange possible anymore in uh, the modern world. Tropical forest decreased by 25%. And we irrigate only about 20% of the cropland, but this is uh, responsible for 40% of the food we produce. And the question is, can we increase this to increase this to feed even more people? And how much water we have? And where do we have the water to do that? Where do we have the soils? And so forth. So already the sedentary life form is challenged whether the land, water, and people are in the right time, in the right place. Uh, we made in water resources management uh, and much progress or, or, or destruction, depending on how you want to see. 40% of the total global runoff is regulated. And this is my unfortunately favorite PowerPoint, uh, a little bit contradicts what yesterday uh, uh, Katarin Erce said that everything shows in the positive direction. I believe Professor Kerekes would have jumped out and would have explained that, yes, uh, the GDP increases, but in the wrong hands and not in the right hands. Uh, if you look into these numbers and only concerned areas affecting at least or around 1 billion people are listed here. And you could see that it is already more than 10 billion, so it is double, triple, quadruple countings are in it. But there are two groups, the subsistence farmers and the slum dwellers. They are distinctly different because they are in different locations. And between these two groups takes place the, uh, the first step of migration, the rural to urban uh, uh, migration, which is unfortunately in most parts of the world not development but despair driven. And this is a very essential thing that migration is not anymore going to the opportunity, but to fleeing the situations you are in. It. This, is, this is a very essential feature which could make uh, 21st century migration even more problematic than anything before. Now, if you take this into account, you come to the conclusion that at least 2 billion, if not more, people are living in conditions none of us want to even see. How many of you have been ever in a urban slum? Okay, I was also only in the border where when I wanted to go in Sao Paulo, people said you will not come out alive because they immediately see that you are not from here and before asking questions they just finish you off. Okay, whether it would have been the case, I don't know. 
I did not go, so I'm here. We have actually the framework to tackle this, and I believe Professor Karakers will explain why it is a so-called wicked problem. And if you, uh, Chandor, would do it, uh, I uh, save a lot of things which is even too difficult for me to grasp. But the member states, <laughs> imagine, they agreed to fulfill by 2030 uh, 17 sustainable development goals, wiping out poverty, so it has about 1 billion people, white, wiping out hunger, good health, etc. Wonderful objectives, 169 targets and 230 indicators. <coughs> However, these are very simplified, almost childish indicators, and these are national scale reporting, and the member states report themselves on their own development. You do not need to be a democratic country uh, to uh, make much better reports than the situation is. This is, uh, I just pick only the six uh, water goal. This is very good because it goes beyond water supply, sanitation and hygiene objectives to water. It addresses water quality. It recognizes that water bodies are ecosystems and biodiversity bound and have to be protected. It talks about integrated water resources management and water efficiency and, of <laughs> course, capacity development, cooperation and participation. Wonderful. But it does not address the synergies and trade-offs, even within these objectives, not to speak among the 17 objectives. Uh, water disasters, which is major killer and major problem, are not addressed together with the water, but with the urban objectives. Unrealistic deadlines, for example, they claim by 2020 all water ecosystems will be remedied. If you put unrealistic deadlines, you are just jeopardizing the seriousness of your objectives. But you cannot achieve and you claim it is something like when my grandfather promised me to buy a horse. Uh, he stopped when my father told him, watch out, you have to buy a horse for him. And he did not want to buy a horse, so I have no horse. <laughs> okay. And oversimplified indicators I mentioned, and no budgetary provisions. But it's obligatory. 190 states all voted for it. And it was masterminded by a Hungarian diplomat, Csaba Kőrösi, who was a co chair of the open uh, working group in the UN. And as his co chair from Kenya, got a heart attack because of the negotiations. He basically did it alone. Uh, I don't go into detail, but it is just showing that the water quality SDG target, one target from 196, if you consider the improving human health, food security, and energy access, how many loops and feedbacks and, and, and <coughs> negative feedback loops are involved. And this is only uh, one target towards three other objectives. And we have 17. You realize it is uh, mind-boggling, however, a very good framework if we would act upon it. Uh, urbanization is a long ongoing process and it's <coughs> difficult to say whether it is good or bad. Anyhow, you see that the 100 biggest cities in the world are exponentially increasing. Uh, in 1800, the average size of the 100 largest cities were 200,000 people each. By 1900, about 700, in 2006.2 million. At present, we have roughly 700 million people living in mega cities, uh, cities more than 10 million inhabitants. This is 10% of the population. And we expect that uh, not only uh, mega cities, but urban population will be around 70% by 2050. What does it mean? It means, in one hand, that you can probably uh, apply solutions which are unpayable in a rural context because of big distances, but we accumulated wealth people and critical infrastructure into places, and some of these cities are not located in a location where a human settlement should be located. Osaka and Tokyo are bloody dangerous places. And if an uh, earthquake a la 1928 would hit Tokyo, what the losses would be there, I cannot figure it out. And our urban systems, even so the talk is resilient cities, etc., are not at all resilient. And if our colleague Dan uh, Brooks would be here, he would say, but I'm borrowed from here, there are more abandoned cities 
in the world than destroyed ones. So more cities had to be given up without war, without defeat. Now, what does it imply for the rural area? If you look into the most developed countries, and unfortunately we have no other development paradigms yet, if you take the US agriculture or Dutch agriculture, you realize you don't need more than 5% of the people in rural area to grow the food. It means we are getting more and more people into cities. What can we do with them? What can, kind of job can we give them? This is an open question. And it is also the uh, question implicitly of the sustainability of our societies where some millions of people might become idle. I did not use this word, but keep in mind, if you, don't be, if you won't be able to give people real good and uh, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, occupation, this uh, uh, can lead to a lot of problems. Uh, society versus water systems, and we see that we want supply security, we want security from uh, uh, water-related hazard events, and actually, especially in the Western uh, uh, area where people have enough money to think of preserving and rehabilitating nature, uh, to rehabilitate natural ecosystems. And there are multiple conflicts all along. And uh, therefore, if you deal with water, it is as much politics as technical matter. Water is politics. And uh, I was educated as a water resources engineer in, uh, uh, in Hungary in the 1960s, where uh, uh, water was not politics but technical fixes. And we did not even use the term uh, ecosystems. It was all technical stuff, so uh, it is also a personal voyage for everybody who has already 60 or 70 years on his account. How important is water, especially in agrarian economies, shows the case of Ethiopia and Zimbabwe, where you see that the real GDP growth almost correlates completely with the variability of rainfall. So it means that water and economy, if you have a an ecosystem-based economy, as in most of the agrarian countries, are essentially connected. Uh, this is a picture from Charlie Vörösmarty, yet another I ask Stalwart, who shows that in the late 20th century, we dealt with water scarcity questions on country base, and you see that uh, Northern Africa and Middle East, Western Asia countries where already more than 40% of the renewable water resource was used. And you see wonderful dark blue countries, including Australia, which is a bloody dry continent, but has not too many people, so the uh, water use is relatively little compared to the available water, where you would call water rich. But if you go into a pixel-based uh, uh, representation and not in a country scale, then you realize that even dark blue countries have huge areas where water scarcity is a major problem in Argentina, northeast of Brazil, uh, Chile and, and Peru, and western US and Mexico are actually also almost as bad as the Middle East. And even if you look into this pixel-based uh, representation, you see something completely astonishing. By using the country uh, uh, accounting, you figure out that the bulk of the population of the world is living in moderately or medium high water stressed areas, and only uh, uh, very uh, few people are to be found in countries which are extremely water scarce. If you go to the pixel-based representation, the distribution function completely changes shape. You are either in a well-endowed pixel or you are in a very badly endowed pixel. And even so, many of the major cities are in this area, but they get water from other pixels. But if you compare water availability, people and pixels, then you see that the problem is completely different depending simply on the scale of uh, resolution of the problem which is very essential how to address these problems. And the rich and poor uh, distribution, answers one of the core reasons of un unsustainability, shows that 16% of the world population <coughs> is living on the wettest half, 
and 84% of the population has the other half of the water resources of the world. Um, how do we deal with it? And this is again Charlie Goreshmarty and his team. We show that a uh, very complicated picture, but it remains here. You could uh, download and, and see it. Uh, the green spots where situation is improving, and dark red when it remains bad, orange is when it worsens, and, and blue is when it is uh, it used to be good and it is still very good. This is places where there are no people. Uh, and you see that uh, situations were improving. This is actually the rich OECD countries. And the situation is even more interesting here. If the GDP of the country is shown here, the red bars are the incident threat to water security, so water quality deterioration, loss of biodiversity. And the yellow bars are the actual situation. So it means if you throw money to the problem, you can diminish, but you have to have this money to do it. And this money was ex uh, estimated in 2015 to be annually 750 billion US dollars only in the OECD and BRIC countries, annually. So we are having a paradigm develop, impaired, and then repair. And this is actually also unsustainable because we are treating syndromes instead of causes. Business as usual also in water actually unaffordable for the poor and unsustainable for the world. And this is also very important that threat is a byproduct of development. We have to recognize that if we have development and improvement in one account, there are certain trade-offs, certain losses in one of the directions which we have to uh, take into account when the original decisions are uh, taken. Uh, human development and biodiversity uh, is, uh, is sometimes uh, um, contradicting and uh, indicators that the biodiversity loss is, is by <coughs> orders of magnitude higher than what scientists claim to be sustainable uh, indicate that we are uh, in a uh, basically in, in odds with what or supporting ecosystem the earth. I believe this was the last one. No, there is one more which is even worse because it uh, shows that if you have water related possible tipping points, the northernmost point is the Netherlands, and this is sea level rise and salt water intrusion for a country of which one third is below sea level. But all others you see in the dry belt in the southern hemisphere, and you see only the northern landmass, which is probably free of water-related possible tipping points. So, welcome to the Arctic century. And if climate change takes in course, this would be prime uh, uh, locations to live. Unfortunately, here you face the Red Army, uh, and whether Canada has uh, military power to uh, or uh, stomach to stop it, this I cannot judge, but uh, the situation is serious enough. Thank you very much.